I'm with Susan Orgel just outside of Nagambi and we're talking about soil carbon, soil carbon trading schemes, ESGs and things that give me a bit of a headache. Susan, can you help us unpack a little bit what the difference between soil carbon credits and ESGs are? We'll start out with soil carbon credits because that's where you play yep. and then we'll talk about ESGs and where people might be able to get some reassurance and rest their minds a little bit about the coming compliance with ESGs. Yep, okay. <laughs> so with soil carbon projects, that happens under the ACU scheme, the Australian Carbon Credit Scheme, regulated uh, by the Clean Energy Regulator, so the Australian Government. And to have a registered soil carbon project, you need to use the approved methodology. Which is what you guys do. That's what we do. Because it's complex. Yeah, it's very complex. And and done well, it creates a great opportunity for growers, but implemented poorly, it can introduce risk into the farm business. So, it's And you see that every day, don't you? you see, there's a lot of service providers. You kick a rock these days and there'll be another service provider crawling out from underneath it. Yeah. But there's very few that employ credible scientists with good approaches, and you happen to be one of those people. Yeah, well, I'd like to think our team is science-led. We don't say yes to everything. We're evidence-based and it needs to make good sense for us as a business, but for us as our partner business with that farm as well. Well, let's talk and dive in a little bit more to soil carbon credits and trading soil carbon. Um, when we're looking at a good carbon project, there's the biophysical things that we look at. So um, is there an opportunity to build soil carbon in terms of low initial soil carbon levels to begin with? Yep. Is there an eligible practice change which can be made? Um, and the productivity benefits of making that practice change as well. That's like a really important way of de-risking projects. Um, size, so the area is also really important and so is the climate because we want projects which are going to be able to maintain a higher level of soil organic carbon. Uh, it's a very good opportunity for some people um, and it can be a risky decision for others. Well let's unpack all of that and take it back a step or two and then take people on the journey. So soil carbon is basically sugars that are produced by plants that are locked up in the soil through various pathways. Yep, absolutely. So as plants photosynthesize, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, energy from the sunlight, they grow their leaves, their stems, their roots and their root exudates, can make pathways into the soil and that's the form of soil organic matter. And soil organic matter can be stabilised or it can be rapidly decomposed, which is what's agronomically desirable in terms of nutrients being released back to plants. Now some soils are really good at storing carbon, some soils are not, but there mm -hmm. are practices that you can put in place as a farmer to make any soil store carbon better yep. and to make carbon available for fertility and growth better. Um, you're interested in helping larger farmers unlock the potential of their soils and potentially also increase their revenue to pay for doing that. Yeah, absolutely. So the way that our soil carbon program works at Select Carbon is we partner, we're an end-to-end -end carbon service provider. We partner with farmers for 25 years, so the term of their project, which is registered with the Clean Energy Regulator. And we design strategies in partnership with the farmer to increase organic matter supply and carbon sequestration to the soil. So there's things that we think about in terms of the soil type. So clays are better at accumulating and stabilizing soil carbon. Um, and also kind of the, re the reality of climate from the farming system's point of view as well. So when, you, when you're looking at a farm to develop a plan, there's a lot of different tools in your toolbox, aren't there? It could be the vegetation that you're looking at growing. It could be the practices of, of, of grazing management that the farmer's got, currently got in place. There could be soil treatments and emollients that you might be able to use. You're going to put together a fairly extensive plan. What does Select Carbon want in return for putting that plan together? Uh, so as part of the 25 year partnership that we have with farmers, um, our service fee is a share of the credits. Now, carbon credits, can you get carbon credits for stuff you've already done? No, you can't. So to get carbon credits issued by the Australian government, it needs to be an eligible project which has been registered. That project needs to be baseline, so soil samples need to be collected so you know your starting point, and you can only get carbon credits issued for increases in soil carbon. Susan, when people are choosing a service provider, and you're one of many service providers in this area at the moment, if you kick a rock, there's a new startup with a soil <laughs> 
soil carbon service provider, but you're one of the better, better recognized ones. What are the things that you should be looking for in your service provider and in the agreement and the contract that you enter into if you're choosing to get carbon credits for your operation? Yeah. So um, first of all, on the Carbon Market Institute website, they've got some really good tips on kind of looking at service agreements, which is impartial. And we'll put a link in the description to that. Yeah, and that's very, very helpful and useful. Um, the things that I always remind farmers that I work with about to ask is owning your own project. So with Select Carbon, it's the farmer that owns their project. They're the project proponent. That means they're in charge of the decisions around the land management and the practice change. I think that's really important because projects should be part of the farming business um carbon's like the like add-on not the trade-off so they should be able to make those well it's building decisions. fertility isn't it so yeah. why wouldn't you own the project that builds your fertility on Ab the farm yeah absolutely so that is really important um, we partner for 25 years so we're there for the highs and any potential lows recognizing that carbon can change um through seasons as well. So it's about an, an, an increasing trend that we're after. Now, there's a good reason for 25 years. There's yep. only two types of carbon project that are recognised in Australia, aren't there? 25 years and 100. Yep, two permanence periods, 25 years or 100 years. If you select a 25 year permanence period, which is what we work with, with our growers, um, then there's a discount for having that 25 years period. So um, there's a mandatory discount that the government withholds in terms of issuance. So if a carbon provider wants to partner with you for 10 years, uh, that basically means the last 15 years of the project are going to be left completely on you. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. So I see that as a bit of a risk um, because typically what we see when we look to the evidence, when you implement a practice change, you'll get an increase in sequestration for the first five to 10 years. And then because this soils are a living system, it'll start to plateau out. Yep. And so most of your change happens. And then it's thinking about for us, we think, all right, for the next 10 or 15 years, where's, what's the, the, next next, where's the next game to be had? Yeah, right. Um, but that's like an active part of the partnership. If you're just there, if someone's just there for 10 years, I think it would just be thinking about kind of what are you doing for the next 15 years unsupported in your carbon project? What, what are your options gonna be then? How do you see farmers using their carbon credits? When is a good idea to sell some and when is a good idea to hang on to them? Because my personal opinion is hang on to everything that you've got in terms of fertility. Yeah. Okay, yeah, no, so that's a very good question. So with a project with us, because you own your project, you own the carbon credits, your share, and you can choose to do whatever you like with them. So what I see is I see some growers holding on to them. Some people will definitely sell carbon credits. Some people will bank and wait for later. Some people will use their carbon credits in the future to offset their own emissions, if that becomes um, a requirement of their markets. Uh, if you sell your carbon credits, yep. um, that is the only time when you start to make money out of the carbon credits. So I think yes. that's a little bit of confusion that people think you make money out of doing a soil carbon project. You make money when you sell credits. That's when the income actually happens. Um, if you sell your carbon credits and uh, levels decrease over time. So there's time. a drought, say, for example, uh, yeah. for 10 years or yeah. something like so that. So with the drought, there's a buffer put into the ACU scheme for soil carbon projects of 5%, and that is 5% okay. risk of reversal buffer against things like a drought, fire or flood. So that's kind of written. So there is that buffer. So there, there. is some protection already in the system yeah, for that. Yeah, at the scheme level. That's exactly right. right. So that's what that's there for. Um, though we need to think about, I guess, uh, adopting a practice change which can increase soil carbon over time so you're mitigating any risk of having to hand back credits. So that can be done by working in collaboration with the grower, with their farm consultant, being responsive to seasonal conditions, being realistic about expectations as well. So measuring increases in soil carbon, but thinking about the permanence of those increases as well. But at the end of the day, it is the farmer's choice what they do with their carbon credits. Now you can do your own carbon your own carbon program yourself um, but it's really important to understand that it's incredibly complex and but the baseline is the the foundation of it all and if you get that wrong you're really in trouble for the next 25 yeah, years. Yeah absolutely and I've seen this recently where growers have come to us where perhaps they're not happy with the carbon service provider they've started working with the baseline has a huge amount of error so mm -hmm. when we think about the method the method is there um, for compliance and guidance so it, it's the bare minimum 
and going above compliance is what can generate a high integrity and project and de-risk projects as well. Um, so you could still be method compliant and have a very noisy baseline. And, and a noisy baseline will give error that might mean you end up with very few carbon credits for a whole lot of work. That's right. And then you've got kind of, you're holding that baseline for your 25 years of your carbon project. So can so, I come to you and get them, get you to do another baseline? Part of, uh, no. So once you've got your registered project and your baseline, that is your baseline for the 25 years. So our approach is like we're a team of scientists so it is very science based and our um, our service fee is structured as such that we only get carbon credits issued like when you get carbon credits issued so that is our payment structure so, so you get a our... percentage of the gain from the works that you carry out that's exactly right so we cover all the other we cover all the costs of the project other than implementing the practice change itself um, and I've often been asked around us paying for the practice change, but for me, the farmer's got to have buy-in. It's got to be good for the farm business. It needs to be something they want to do to have a high integrity and a successful project as well. But baselining is exceptionally important because typically what we see with increases in soil organic carbon is it might be small incremental increases in a variable landscape. So we want to be real about detecting change. We want to make sure it's measurable, verifiable and attributable to management, not just good seasons. So if people are interested in getting a carbon plan going on their property because it's going to make them more money, um, what sort of size of property or what sort of operation is best suited to working with an organisation like yours, for example? Yeah, so I guess because of how our, uh, our um, partnership is structured, so we have like minimum levels really, but it depends, on, it depends on what the likely forward abatement would be, so how much increase for a given area we could get. So yep. if you're in low rainfall areas, we're talking thousands of hectares to make it a commercially viable project for us. In higher rainfall areas, we're talking hundreds of hectares. So it just depends. And part of our process is working through who we want to partner with and is it a good decision for them and for us in terms of investing in that in that project. Carbon is going to become very important for everyone when we bring in ESG compliance. Now a number of the banks and the large food buyers are talking about all farmers that deal with them or sell them goods having to have an ESG. How complex do you think that landscape is going to become for the family farm in Australia? Oh, look I think so it's going to become complex and there's an opportunity in that complexity done well yep. um, and there can also be risk in terms of bigger companies or value chains kind of supply chains sorry pushing down some of those expectations onto farmers so yep. so an abdication or a dereliction of duty in some way yeah the and thinking about so um, for some of these companies their scope three emissions are the farmers scope one right so if they're yep. going to reduce their scope three emissions it's around the farmers reducing their scope one so that's Scope one are things that the farmer can control yep. in the production processes emissions. of their of their plant. That's exactly yeah. right. And so I often get asked around kind of so there's ACU scheme participation, so that's a registered soil carbon project. And then there's carbon neutrality and a whole lot of other schemes. Yeah, right? so yeah. The ACU scheme, and it's a bit messy out there, isn't it, oh, to know what to do? Abs yeah, it absolutely is. The ACU scheme, it's in legislation, it's very prescriptive and compliance-based. And that's it's, what you do. That is what we do, and it's voluntary to participate in. So yeah. while it's, it's a compliance-based market for the big emitters, participation from um, growers, it's voluntary to participate in, right? So it's an opportunity for some people. It can pay and or enable a practice change but it's not for everyone and it's not that the practices work everywhere all the time so you need like a team to advise on a good project whereas when we're looking at ESG reporting and car like carbon neutral claims and having that come into supply chains um, it's similar in terms of emissions accounting and carbon footprinting but it's far less regulated at the moment. Perhaps stand back continue best practice, keep your data, keep your records and find out what unfolds before you jump into it. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And I do think kind of knowing where you're starting from, like, like we are a carbon service provider, but I am a soil carbon scientist and I 100% think that just knowing your number in terms of carbon concentration in the top 10 centimetres of your farm is a very good place to start. So that's not a registered carbon project. It doesn't cost a lot of money. It's around that soil health metric to say, am I within an acceptable level? What could I do differently to increase? Like that is a great place to start for soil carbon. So if people are worried about ESG compliance coming down on them in the long term, keep your record and work on your soil.
Oh, I think so, yeah, that sounds good. Guys, if you want more information like this, don't forget to hit the little subscribe button, give it a thumbs up, and we'll see you next week for something else. Susan, thank you so much. Oh, no worries, thanks, good Tim. Idea.